Welcome to the Larry Arn Show on the Hillsdale College Podcast Network. I would be Larry Arn, president of Hillsdale College, and I have a great and mighty guest today, and his name is Jordan Peterson. Jordan Peterson is a psychologist and an academic, and he's had two careers, I think it's fair to say. In one, he taught some at Harvard and uh, wherever he taught, later for a long time at Toronto, University of Toronto, and wherever he taught he leaves a trail behind him of students who love him. And they testify to what it is about him that they love, and you're going to see it for yourself in a few minutes. In his second career, it starts when a few years ago he took a stand about something, which was a law in Canada that would require people change all kinds of things that defy everything ordinary, gender stuff mostly. And he stood up against that. And, of course, a firestorm came, And he didn't retreat into any hole. He'd never been any good at being in a hole. He decided to go public. And what I like about, I I admire him very much and know him well, I'm privileged that way, is that his public career follows the same pattern as his academic career. He's a teacher, and he's relentless, and he's curious, and he knows a lot of stuff. And he teaches people, and they are grateful except for the ones who don't want teaching to happen, and they are enraged. And he's courageous in the face of that. Welcome, Jordan Peterson. Thank you, sir. Because you're a teacher and because I'm curious about it, uh, I want to talk about psychology, about what it is. Uh, And I know that you like Carl Jung, and because of that, I never did without knowing much about him. I've been reading up on him some, and I want you to explain the general thing. What is the discipline of psychology? And then something about him, if you care to say. Well, we all exist at multiple levels simultaneously, right? We exist at subatomic level and the atomic level and the molecular level and the level of organs and the level of our body. And and we have motivational systems and emotional systems and cognitive systems and perceptual systems and Psychology is the study of the, the, the integration of all of those subordinate levels into the individual, right? So you can study all those levels right up to the level of the individual, and, and you're in the domain of psychology. And so I like that, that integrative function of psychology. And so when I was in graduate school in particular, the PhD work I did was really quite biological. I was looking at the genetic the psychological manifestations of the genetic predisposition to alcoholism and antisocial behavior. And alcohol is a pharmacological agent and it spreads through the brain like water because it crosses the blood brain barrier. It's one of the few chemicals that can do that. And so to study alcohol's effect on psychology, you have to study alcohol's effect on the brain, but it affects every bit of the brain and every bit of the brain is quite a lot to study. And so as I was studying alcoholism and the predisposition to alcoholism, I was simultaneously studying how the brain works to understand how alcohol and other drugs changed its function. And that got me deep into the study of neuroscience and affect of neuroscience in particular. That's the neuroscience of emotion and motivation. And that was a burgeoning field at the time. And I read some of the great early classic works in that field. And at the same time, I was reading a lot of work on the clinical front, great clinicians, including the people you mentioned, Freud and Jung. And I was integrating across those, which was something that that hadn't been done. And my first book, Maps of Meaning, was an attempt to integrate across all those levels from the biological to the narrative. That's a good way of thinking about it. Uh, Jung, do you call yourself a Jungian? To some degree, yes. Um, I, w- I don't describe myself that way, but it's definitely the case. I mean, I, 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 I started reading Freud before I read Jung, and I liked Freud a lot for a variety of reasons. So we, we could go back to Nietzsche to explain this more properly. So Nietzsche, back in the late 1800s, announced that God was dead. And what he meant by that, essentially, was that the unity of conception that had brought us together psychologically and socially was disintegrating. And Nietzsche knew what the consequence of that would be. 
he knew that the consequence of that would be nihilism and hopelessness on the one hand, and a turn towards totalitarian certainties on the other. He nailed that. Dostoevsky knew the same thing. And Nietzsche saw a way out, he thought, and his way out was that human beings would have to become, they would have to adopt the mien of what they had deposed. And so he thought that people would have to become gods in some way. And that we could do that by creating our own values, that we would have to take it upon ourselves to create our own values since they were no longer handed down on high from some transcendent source. And all of the arguments that Nietzsche laid out were very powerful, including that one. But reading Freud helped me understand why Nietzsche was wrong. Because Freud noted more clearly than anyone else, at least at that time, that we were not the masters in our own houses. And that the notion that we could produce our own values was predicated on an assumption that in some manner, we were intrinsically unitary masters of our own destiny, our own cognition, our own perceptions, our own emotional states. And Freud really flipped that on its head. He said, no, we're more like a haunted house full of autonomous spirits. And those spirits have, those would be complexes in the psychoanalytic term. And those complexes, those autonomous spirits, some of which are motivational forces, let's say, or emotional, uh, emotional systems, they have an autonomy and a will that can easily supersede our own. And so it isn't obvious at all that because we're masters of, not masters in our own house, that we can in any way create our own values. And Freud, I think the weakness of Freud was that he pronounced one motivational system superordinate, sex. And you could say with some real truth that Freud replaced the god of his ancestors, Yahweh. Freud was Jewish. He replaced the god of his ancestors with, with sexuality and put that at the pinnacle of human of the human psychological hierarchy. And Jung, who was a student of Freud's, although also a student of Nietzsche's, and perhaps more deeply a student of Nietzsche's, objected to that. He did not believe that it was appropriate to make the presumption that sex ruled over all. And I read a lot of Jung, when I, especially when I was in graduate school. I think he had I think there's 20 volumes in his collected work, something like that. I read every single one of them. And I didn't just read them. I actually understood them. And that took a lot of work. I read Archetypes of the Collective Unconscious. It was the first book by Jung I wrote. I read a um, little Freudian slip there. Um, I read it three times before I knew what the hell he was talking about. Because what Jung is talking about is so strange that it's almost impenetrable. And then when you do penetrate it, it's terrifying. That's why psychologists don't like Jung. That's why people in general don't. It's like, he's very hard to understand. And then when you do understand him, he's very, very terrifying. Because Freud made the case that we were haunted by ghosts and Jung made the case that we were haunted by demons and gods. And that's much more accurate. And when you start to understand that, man, the world is not the same. It is seriously not the same. So, uh, we're going to talk about sex some today, because that's all over the place. Desire, estrangement from, and fascination with sex today have to do with Freud? Um, it has to do with what Freud observed, because, and Freud was correct in that sex is a dominating force. Nietzsche said, every drive attempts to philosophize in its spirit. Brilliant, brilliant aphorism. He was really something. And when when the world collapses into materialist atheism, let's say, it's highly likely that sex will arise as the dominant goddess, likely goddess. It's likely on the feminine side more, more accurately if you think about it historically. Now, did Freud bring that about? Part, partly because Freud made the case that there was no metaphysical reality let's say, there were biological realities and that the prime biological reality was that of sex. And so he laid some of the groundwork for those metaphysical claims. But Freud, to speak in Freud's defense, even though he believed that sex was a dominating force, it isn't clear at all that he believed that it should be. Now, if you pushed Freud on what he thought should be at the pinnacle of the moral hierarchy, 
he would say something like the ability to work and play. And that's not bad. You know, that's not too bad. Mm -hmm. And he had a wisdom. And Freud was also a very practical clinician. But he also viewed, see, Freud was deeply anti-religious in the Enlightenment tradition. And he told Jung at one point that it was necessary to make of the dog of the doctrine of sexual motivation an unshakable bulwark against a black tide of occultism. And it's an interesting, interesting phrase because there was a black tide of occultism coming, and we've certainly seen that unfold over the course of the 20th century. But it also highlights one of Freud's metaphysical weaknesses. And it was the weakness that separated Jung from Freud, was that, and that was that Freud's materialist, deterministic atheism made him incapable of contending with the realities of the religious world properly. And that undermined his, what would you say, his ability to sit at the proper pinnacle of the, of the psychoanalytic hierarchy. So Jung believed, like Jung believed, that he had a conception that he put forward as the self. And the self is you, is the four-dimensional you. And so why four dimensions? Well, because here you are now in this room at this time, but you are something that extends across time from birth till death. And the totality of you is that entire being is stretched across time. And Jung's self is the four-dimensional totality of the person. And Jung was a very sophisticated thinker. And he believed that Christ was a symbol of the self. Now, what Jung believed religiously, that's a very difficult thing to put your finger on because he was a very sophisticated thinker. Um, I would put him firmly in the Christian camp. But he's not a normal Christian by any stretch of the imagination. When he says something like, Christ is a symbol of the self, he meant something very deep. He meant that, well, he meant, for example, that at the highest level of conceptualization, the human being is something doomed to suffer through death and hell and to emerge reborn. And, and he really believed that. And, and not in the way that you believe something preposterous because it's an element of faith, but because he saw that as the deepest form of wisdom, and he also saw it as something that was inevitably true. The soul is by nature Christian. That was certainly something Jung believed. Now let's try to relate that, because so something amazing is going on in the world. Uh, we are trying to transform ourselves into whatever we want to be, sexual and everything else. And you've taken a stand against that. I'd like you to say why, and also what in psychology has led you to well, do that. When, 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 when you say, so there's a battle right now going on in our culture about self-definition. I am whatever I say I am, which is, by the way, what God said to Moses when he proclaimed his identity, right? And that's not a trivial comment on what's happening now. Jung believed that the logical conclusion of Protestantism was that everyone would become their own church. Right? And he really meant, when Jung said something, he meant it, like all the way down. And so the logical conclusion of you being your own church is that you're your own God and that you get to define yourself. And you might say, well, why can't I define myself? And the answer, the right answer is, what the hell do you know about who you are? And you think that there's something in you that's yourself that's defining you. But how do you know you're not just a pawn of that thing you think is yourself? And so the fatal weakness on the self-definition front is, oh, I see, you're gripped so firmly by your sexuality that your sexuality now proclaims that it's you and you believe that. And you think that's you. You don't think that you're worshiping a polytheistic pagan goddess or that, it, or that she's got you in her grip. You think that's you because you have an intrinsic theory of yourself and your theory of yourself is whatever you want hedonistically in this moment rules everyone, including you, and that's right. And that everyone who opposes that is nothing but a, a demon, essentially. And that means everybody yeah. who opposes that doesn't get the same favor. They can't, they can't define themselves the way they well, want. Well, that's the, that's the incoherence problem, but the, but the radical types, the 
the narcissistic radical types, they don't give a damn about incoherence because what they give a damn about is that they get to do exactly what the hell they want with whoever they want this moment. And if that's, now this is, this is where the rubber meets the road, you might say, well, what's the problem with that? It's like, why can't I just do whatever the hell I want whenever the hell I want to do it with whoever I want to do it with? And the answer is, because everything goes to hell if you do that, including you. And you say, well, I don't believe in hell. And I say, well, keep acting the way you are and you will. Right. For sure. Now, everyone with an ounce of sense, an iota of sense, and this is actually what defines sense, knows perfectly well. If they only do exactly what they want to do in accordance with the whim of the moment, which then becomes their God, right? Because if you're motivated by the whim of the moment and you place that above all else, that is now your God. Well, what's the God? Well, in this case, let's say it's sexual motivation. Well, if sexual motivation is your God, you will end up in something indistinguishable from hell because you will, you will misuse other people. You will make them objects of your own narrow and immediate desire. And you'll have no relationships. You'll exploit everyone, including yourself. And there's, that's no way to live. Well, why is that no way to live? You're just moralizing. It's like, no, live like that for two years and find out what happens. No one with any sense will want to be within 20 feet of you. <laughs> and that's because you'll do nothing but exploit, including, and the thing you'll exploit will include that higher self whose existence you don't, you, you don't even imagine, right? Because you've already subjugated yourself to the immediacy of your idiot whim. And the people who identify themselves on sexual grounds do that all the time. My paramount feature is who I'm sexually attracted to. It's really, that's your paramount feature, is it? That's your definition of your intrinsic self. To call you primitive is an insult to primitive people. <laughs> if, uh, so, uh, I want to suggest what's been swept away by all this. Uh, in classic philosophy, in most philosophy since then, the idea was we have a nature. Everything has a nature. And the nature and our happiness and well-being depends upon fulfilling our nature. Uh, my little bit of reading of Jung suggests that he thought roughly like that. that. In other words, if he was going to give somebody therapy, he tried to help them become a better person, like a person would be. Well, that word nature is interesting because uh, it comes from a Latin word that means birth. It means the process of begetting and growth by which we come to be. Well, if you lose your nature, then you have no purpose outside your own will. And now my question, you've been particularly helpful and popular with men, young men especially. Why is that, do you think? Well, you, you can't lose your nature exactly. You can lose your higher order, integrated, purpose-driven nature. Here's some natures you won't lose. Pain. Anxiety. Like, you can lose your higher nature all you want, and all of the negative elements of your nature will predominate. And you're not going to rationalize yourself out of pain and anxiety. This is the thing about those who believe life has no meaning. It's like, I see, so you think you can argue yourself out of your pain? Because pain's a meaning. Now, you might say, well, it's not a meaning I want to pursue. It's like, what does that have to do with anything? Pain is an undeniable reality. Well, if you allow your higher order self to disintegrate, you, dis you disintegrate into a landscape characterized by pain, anxiety, and hopelessness. That's the metaphysical desert, by the way, right? That's the place you end up devolving into when your tyrannical presuppositions are disintegrate, which is why people cling to their tyrannical presuppositions because, you know, there's a mystery. Well, you don't want to end up in the landscape of pain, anxiety, and hopelessness. And I actually mean that technically because what happens when you lose direction, the biological systems that mediate negative emotions signal loss of direction. That's what anxiety is. It's a signal of loss of direction. So if you lose higher order direction, you become anxious. Well, and you can argue with anxiety all you want with your atheistic nihilism, but it isn't going to go away and neither is your pain. And so one of the things I've told my audiences is, you have to be a fool if you doubt the reality of pain and anxiety, pain and terror, let's say. Are they real? It's like, well, of course, that's an ontological argument. 
they're real enough so you'll act like they're real if they come knocking. So maybe we can suffice, we can we can satisfy ourselves with that proclamation. And you say, well, are they the ultimate reality, pain and, and suffering? And that's a good question. That's a tough question. And I would say, no. The things that transcend pain and suffering are more real than pain and suffering. Well, what transcends suffering? The eternal verities transcend suffering. And the higher order nature of man is the antidote to catastrophic suffering. It's the antithesis of hell. Well, what is that? Is that real? Well, if pain and suffering are real, and if you can transcend them through allegiance with a higher order self, well, then the higher order self is obviously not only real, but more real. Well, what is that? Well, this is why Jung said Christ was a symbol of the self. Um, how do you transcend the eternal realm of suffering, right? How do you escape from hell? It's the same question. Um, how about voluntary self-sacrifice? How about that? Well, that's absolutely no different than the image of the crucifix. Those are the same thing. Well, why does the spirit of voluntary self-sacrifice protect you against suffering? Well, I need to sacrifice my idiot whims in the moment to serve that element of me that is continuous across time. This is like Kant's categorical imperative in some ways. If I'm wise and mature, then I don't make decisions now that will cost me tomorrow or next week or next month or next year or five years down the road. I, I contemplate my extended self, which is like a community across time, and I bind my decisions in the present by my covenant with my future self. And there's no difference between doing that. That means I sacrifice my the whims of the moment to the, to the optimization of the medium and long run. And I do the same thing in relationship to other people. Those are the same thing. There is no difference. This is, this is a gospel equation in some ways. There is no difference between treating you properly and treating myself properly. And that's because in the final analysis, there's actually no difference between you and me. Well, not, not, not fundamentally. The classic account of this, the American account for most of our history, is that's because we're the same kind of thing. Mm -hmm. We're equal. And that, and in what way are we equal? We're equal in our natures. Uh, and and the trouble part comes this way: if our natures include how we come to be, then the differences between the sexes are also part of our rights, mm -hmm. and also therefore our obligations. And that's what uh, you're telling me this morning about a law that's proceeding in Ireland and. Uh, they're going to make it illegal to possess books that claim that sex is an innate feature or that you don't get to choose your own. Is that what it is? Mm -hmm. That's part of it. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's it depends on how they define. They It, it defend, depends on how they end up defining hate speech, but that's already built into the law that the, the idea that making a distinction between men and women that's categorical, that's already part of hate speech. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and it is in part, it is in part a out spring. This is again where you see the weakness in Nietzsche's argument. Well, here's the values we've created. Well, that's not a very good replacement for God. Our replacement for God is narcissistic radicals get to do whatever the hell they want, whenever they want, all the time. And if you oppose it, then it's prison for you. Well, you know, that's not much of a substitute for what we had before. So. And that was our, I went to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Rome, and that was the first established church. And it became the model for European society. So it's so interesting the way it's, these conceptions are laid out, let's say, architecturally rather than conceptually. So at the very center, you have the crucifix, the cross. And that's, that's what would you say? That's the point where all of reality comes to a point and it's the point of maximal suffering. And it's more than that. It's the point of voluntarily accepted maximal suffering. And the notion is that that's a sacrifice. Why is it a sacrifice? You have to sacrifice. You have to sacrifice your lower self to your higher self in order for you to proceed 
in a healthy manner to be resilient, but also for you to participate in the covenant that would make for a united society. You have to, and that, there's no difference between that and maturation, because a lot of what maturation is, is to give up the attractions of the immediate present in the service of something broader and higher. And that would be you in the broader sense and what's in your best interest, but also the community simultaneously. Those are the same thing. So at the center of the community, you have the sacrifice, the voluntary sacrifice of self. That's the center. Around that, you have the church, you have the altar, then you have the church, then you have the town, and around the town, you have the state, and then you have the nation. And that's all resting on this spirit of voluntary self-sacrifice, right? And that's the foundation stone of the community. Jung knew that. You, Jung knew that. And Freud didn't. And because Freud was, he was a materialistic, deterministic atheist of the 19th century. And Jung is a 20th century thinker. Maybe he's a 21st century thinker even. That's certainly possible. So Churchill said, uh, he wrote once in a book called My Early Life, you must nail your life to a cross of thought or action. Mm -hmm. Now, he ended up doing both. But in either case, whichever way you go, and so you could say, in your life, Jordan Peterson, uh, it was more thought in the beginning, and it might be more action now, but in other case, it's a cross. Hmm. And that's how you think of it? Well, you can either lift up a cross or have one dropped on you. Yeah. A, right? There's no non-cross option in this world. And that's really worth knowing, too. And I tell my audiences that consistently. It's like, you all know perfectly well that your idiot hedonism, hedonism your idiot immature hedonism is going to vanish in a puff of smoke at the first sign of trouble. You know that. And you know that it's thin gruel. That's why you're hedonistic and hopeless at the same time. You know that. You need something beyond that. Why? Because life in some ways is unbearable. And so you need something worth bearing to make it bearable. And life is very heavy load. And so that means you have to carry something very heavy to justify it. Now, I see this in the biblical corpus, for example, quite clearly laid out in the story of Abraham, which is a very interesting story. And of course, Abraham is the founder of nations. And so, and you might say, well, is that true? It's like, those are such stupid questions. That, that's such a stupid question. It's a definition in this story. So the definition is, the spirit of Abraham is the founder of nations, right? That's the that's the declaration of the story. And you're to, you're to come to understand that when you read the story. Now, you might say, well, what did the people who wrote the story mean by that? And the answer is, well, they didn't know. And that's why they wrote the story. Like the story is the explanation. Okay, so what's the story? Well, Abraham is a human being. And that means he's like a natural human being. And that means he's useless and lazy. And if he can have it easy, he will. And so Abraham is like the first case of white privilege. Here's a good joke. He's rich. His parents are rich. And he can just lay around his tent all day and eat peeled grapes and have like beautiful slave women wave palm fronds over him and do nothing. And he does that for like 83 years. Mm. And then one day a voice comes to him, right? A spirit. He's inspired by a spirit. And what's the nature of the spirit? Well, it's the spirit that calls him to adventure. And it says to him, get your lazy ass the hell out of the tent. You're made for more than this. And so Abraham, in a great act of faith, abides by the intuition of this spirit. And he leaves his comfortable infancy, right? Because he's an infant. He lives in an infantile utopia. So, right, well, what do I want? Well, I never want to be hungry and I never want to be thirsty. I never have, I never want to be deprived. It's like, well, great, you're an infant sleeping in a crib. You've got infant paradise. Is that what you're made for, right? The mere cessation of your needs. That's your vision of utopia, is it? Well, that was Abraham's vision of utopia. And a counter spirit came along and said, get your lazy ass the hell out of your tent and get out there in the world. And of course, it's a complete catastrophe, right? Like, he faces tyranny and war and the necessary sacrifice of his son and, and collusion among the aristocrats to steal his wife. And like, it's just a disaster in 10 different directions, but it's an adventure. 
It's an adventure, right? And so what's life? Is it like, is it, is it hedonistic, infantile bliss? This is something Dostoevsky objected to. Or is it a romantic adventure? Well, what do people go watch when they go see a movie? They watch a romantic adventure. Well, why? Because that's what they want in their life. They don't want peace and tranquility and guaranteed basic income and the pleasures of infantile, gratified infantile dependence. They want a bloody adventure. And if they don't get a real adventure, they'll take a false one and wreak havoc. And we have no shortage of false adventures in our culture. So the the woke culture and the transgender movement and all these great things that have come upon us so hard, uh, are they going to suppress that for people? You're not going to get to have your adventure. You're going to have well, to. Well, they put forward a false adventure. And the false adventure is wave a placard and save the world. That's so, right. Look, great. Isn't that wonderful? All you have to do. You know how I stopped getting protesters to my events at university? I held them in the morning. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> no kidding, eh? I'm the Messiah. Yeah, really. Well, as long as you don't want me to get out of bed before noon. Yeah, so that's the false adventure sold to young kids. It's like, well, the planet's going to hell in a handbasket. That's the claim. It's like, yeah, yeah, the planet's always been going to hell in a handbasket, right? The apocalypse is always nigh. And that's because we die and so does everything else. And so, well, the apocalypse is nigh and you can save the world by protesting against those who are at fault. That's the, what the universities sell young people. Well, it's an adventure, right? They have a messianic urge at that age. And that really never goes away in people in some fundamental sense, but it's particularly acute when adolescents, late adolescents, are trying to catalyze their identity, and the left offers these false adventures. You can be, the, you, you print out a sign that says, I oppose poverty, as if anyone doesn't, and you wave that around publicly, which is the same as praying in public, right? It's a great sin, and you proclaim your moral virtue, and bang, that's your adventure. And it's a cheap, it's a cheap pathway to to reputational accomplishment. And, and part of the reason young guys do it, you know perfectly well, is because they're trying to impress young women and it's kind of, uh, what would you say? There's a surface, a surface attraction to being a kind of rebellious, quasi Che Guevara type and to be taking on, you know, the evil corporations of the world when you're 18, you know, instead of, working at 7-Eleven and handing out sugar water to kids. Do you think that there's something that young people really need that will ultimately redeem, redeem them from this, Eno enough of them at least, to save the world? Do you think that they need a burden? They need a burden. Absolutely. And they want one, you're you saying. You bet. Absolutely. Well, and you can explain that to them in some ways the way I just explained it. It's like, look, guys, you're going to suffer. And most of them are already suffering, so they know that. It's like, and do you want to suffer stupidly too? Because that's even worse. And then you do you want to contemplate for a moment what's going to be your arc when the storms come? Well, I can tell you what it is. And you already know this because you've consulted your own conscience. When you're awake at three in the morning thinking about what a useless bastard you are, how many sins you have on your conscience, if you're fortunate, there'll be a few of your adventures come to mind where you think, well, you know, I didn't do so bad then you know maybe there's something to me and so wh what do people remember when they have those memories they remember the times when they stepped outside of their narrow selves and took on some bloody responsibility at least for themselves and then maybe for someone else too and then maybe for a lot of other people and so if you tell young men look you're going to find the meaning in your life by adopting by adopting maximal responsibility, right? That's going to be extremely difficult because you're so bloody useless. You can't even get your own house in order. And you're, and you're going to be called upon not only to get your house in order, but to do that well enough so some woman can stand having you around for more than like 15 minutes in the back of a car. And then maybe you're going to have to do it so that you could be a good father to a family and a pillar of the community. And that's not just empty words. It's like, if you do that nobly, there'll be something to you. And then when the storms come, you won't be blown over by the first four foot wave. And young men think, huh, mean I could be something that wasn't blown over 
by the first four foot wave, they think, oh, well, that's, mm -hmm. that's, that's inspiring. Maybe that's worth doing a little work towards it on the off chance it might be true. And the thing about it is it is true. So it's not that difficult once you understand it to make a case for it. It's true. And it is also true that you grow in proportion to the weight you take on voluntarily. And it's also true that we have no idea what the upper limit to that is, right? So, you know, you, you've met remarkable people in your life. People can do remarkable things. And there are inevitably people who, take, who took on remarkable burdens. And because they did that, their development was forced by necessity. They were forced by necessity to grow beyond what they were. And who knows what the limit to that is? People, uh, so I, something I see in the college business, uh, our college, Hillsdale College, has got about the same number of boys and girls, a few more boys. And they, they come from a pool of applicants that are equal size and equal qualification. Almost nobody has that. Right. And the boys do just about as well as the girls, although they do get into contests doing things like throwing deer urine on each other and stuff. They've done that. But uh, some of the best boys I ever met have done that. As a matter of fact, they're in the Marine Corps now. Stupid boys. <laughs> and, they, and, and the thing is, people will say, how are you successful with boys? And I say, we treat them like boys. You know, they want to be treated like boys. Hmm. They, and, and girls, women, we've always had boys and girls here, women and men here, right? And they've always done well. And their intellectual capacities are, you know, they're the same kind of thing. And their physical uh, paths are not the same. And they can wish them the same if they want to. But, but they don't. Not they don't. really. They don't. I, I mean, I, you know, what I find is, and, and you know, uh, I have two daughters. Uh, you have one, I think. And she's, your daughter is like my daughter's. Very tough. Very assertive. Uh, very womanly, you see. And so, in other words, the, the classic account is they're good at being what they are. And that's a service, you know, human above all, but also male or female. And that's a service, that burden you're talking about. The first burden everyone carries is, how do you become a good one of these? And by, if by thinking it, that's all, as you say, that's no burden. So no satisfaction. Uh, how do you think, predict the future for me a little bit. What's What's going to happen? It seems to me things are coming to a point. Do you think so? Yeah, well, I think things have always been coming to a point, but they're coming to a point way faster. And I mean, that's partly a consequence of the technological revolution. I mean, we know that, well, we have Moore's law, right? Computing power doubles every 18 months. It's like, no, no, you don't understand. Computing power doubles every 18 months. That's not some casual phrase. That's an absolute bloody revolution in every possible direction. And it's not just computing power, it's storage power. And there's all sorts of doublings take, taking place. And we're now at the point in, in the course of technological pro progress where those doublings are happening multiple times within the span of a single life. And so it's pretty obvious. And that means the ancient archetypal battles are accelerating. That's exactly what it means. Mm -hmm. The battles between good and evil is accelerating. And it's always been there. Is the apocalypse nigh? It's like, well, it's always been nigh, but <laughs> it might be a little more nigh than it has been in the past. And I, you've been talking about artificial intelligence, and recently I have become more concerned about that. Uh, yeah. what, what are your concerns and what are your hopes for it? Well, I suppose my fundamental concern is that we'll automate a super intelligent tyranny. Right. And I mean, that's not a concern that's limited to me. That's the, that's the motif of endless numbers of science fiction dystopias. And, you know, science fiction is where you, where engineers dream. Mm -hmm. right. right. And sometimes it's where they have their nightmares and engineers are notoriously atheistic. And so they turn to worship of star Wars, for example, as an alternative, but their nightmares and dreams are in the popular culture in popular imagination and dystopian science fiction is the nightmare of engineers and the nightmare of tower of babel building engineers is that we'll automate a super intelligent tyranny 
Chinese are hell bent on doing that. They're doing it at the moment. Could we do it here? Absolutely. Are we? Yeah. yeah. Will it? Will yeah. will that dominate? We'll see. You know, my sense, and I learned a fair bit of this from Jung. By the way, you know, what I, one of the things I learned from Jung was that deeply was that salvation, redemption, was an individual enterprise, which is why I'm a psychologist and not a politician, because I believe that to be true. I think that hell is, what would you say, kept at bay one person at a time. And I do believe that people have a divine destiny, let's say, and one of the proper elements of our divine destiny is to keep hell at bay. And you do that by, you do that as a consequence of your choices as an individual. I also believe that every single individual is, is in that up to their necks. You know, Dostoevsky said something very strange at one point. He said, every man is responsible not only for everything he does, but for everyone everyone else does. And of course, that's insane, right? In, in that crazy Dostoevsky way that is more sane, that insanity that's more sane than sanity. That's Dostoevsky in a nutshell. And I think there's something true about it is that we each have an archetypal destiny and the, the fate of the world rests on each person's shoulders, like genuinely. And when I'm traveling around the world, talking to people, I'm trying to tell them that. It's like, no, no, you don't understand. This is up to you. Now, I don't understand how it can be up to you because it's also up to me. And I don't exactly see how it can be equally and finally up to both of us, but that's okay. There's lots of things about the world I don't understand. And I suppose being, what would you say, touched by a spark of divinity, which is, I suppose, what characterizes us, each of us bears an infinite responsibility. And it, people need to know that and that it's, this is no game. So you have to carry the burden for more than your own sake. Well, well, it, it, your your indistinct your indis your sake is indistinguishable from the sake of the totality. See, the Buddha figured this out, right? Because Buddha, uh, what would you say? He 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 achieved enlightenment under the bow tree. He was in Nirvana. He was in paradise, and he could stay there. That was on the table, and that's a hell of an offer to be able to stay in paradise. And he rejected it. And the reason he rejected it was because it was, in his estimation, any paradise that it didn't include everyone wasn't the real paradise. And so he left Nirvana to come back to earth, so to speak, to serve as a teacher, to drag everyone else along on the road to Nirvana. And that's, well, that's, that's, that's correct, is that, that, that it's correct in that th there, in the final analysis, there is no distinction between you and someone else. It's a terrible thing to contemplate. They're the same thing. And that's why you're supposed to love your enemy, I suppose. And, and what does that mean, to love your enemy? Well, first of all, it might mean, to begin with, to hope that he wouldn't have to be an enemy. Because why not have a friend? But it's even more than that, is that to the degree that it's possible, your actions, even in the presence of your enemy, should be devoted towards the redemption of your enemy. That would be better for you and for them. I mean, if you're good and your enemy is not good, you'd be right to oppose him for the sake of the good and those who represent it. But Well, you redeem what you can redeem and you reject the rest, right? And that's, that's the separation it. of that's the wheat right. from the chaff. That's it. Well, I learned something a while back about there's this idea at the end of Genesis when God throws Adam and Eve out of paradise. He sets these cherubs up to guard the gates of paradise and they're monstrous forms, these cherubs, and they hold swords that are on fire that turn every which way. It's a very horrifying image. And what does it mean? It means that, well, a sword cuts and cleaves and butchers and kills, but a sword can be used to carve. Eh? So you can think about a sword as an implement that separates the wheat from the chaff. And a burning sword well, that's even worse, right? Because it burns the dead wood away. And so a, a, burn, a flaming sword is a sword that cuts all that isn't necessary away and burns all the dead wood off. And of course, that's the case because everything unworthy has to be cut away in order for it to enter paradise, by definition, and all dead wood has to be burned away before the living essence can enter paradise. That's another way of thinking about it. And if you're 
99% dead wood and pathology, it isn't obvious that the encounter with the flaming sword that turns every which way won't just do you in. And that's, that's the issue of evil in some regard. You want to redeem what can be redeemed, but you need to reject what's truly serpentine. And that's Eve's sin, by the way. She doesn't do that. She hearkens to the serpent itself. And that's a narcissism of compassion. That's her sin. It's a pride of compassion. My womanly embrace is such that all things can be clasped by breast, including the poisonous serpent. It's like, well, yeah, maybe, maybe not including the poisonous serpent. Right. And I see that playing out in the world now because we have this epidemic of narcissistic compassion where everything can be in, in, invited to the table. It's like, well, maybe not everything. Yeah. Right, right. And maybe there's only a small remnant of what is truly hellish that has to be rejected, that there's no hope of redeeming. I mean, this is an ancient theological issue, right? But this was played out quite recently in the case of Nicola Sturgeon, right? Because Sturgeon, in, in the Scottish prime minister, you know, she famously proclaimed that, well, any man who says he's a woman is a woman. It's like, I'm so compassionate. It's like, people can do whatever they want. It's like, any man, eh? How about psychopathic, serialist, serial killing, sadistic rapists? How about them? Well, when she was asked that question, which she was, she had to hand wave, partly because for someone like her, no one like that exists. Not really. But the problem is, is that People like that do exist, or spirits like that exist. So there's an immediate thing we see here coming from artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. and it, it's it can do a passable job writing a term paper. Mm -hmm. We can stop that here. We have an honor code, and most most kids won't do it, almost all. And if they do, it's not too you know. Eventually, it'll be indistinguishable. I'm told. Oh yes, but, it's there already. But you know, oral exams. But here's mm -hmm. what I'm worried about. Uh, this is the, the chairman of Microsoft, who I used to think was a pretty good guy. He proclaims, well, it's not going to write your final. It's going to write your draft. Mm -hmm. But writing your draft, that's where you do most of the learning. Mm -hmm. That's where you read all the stuff that surrounds your subject and decide what's relevant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that means that, and it goes back to something you've taught me, and that is if you can't write a draft of a paper or write your own paper, you become a cripple. Well, that's, see, that's the fundamental issue in the argument. It's, it's because you could say, well, why not just let, if your point is the degree, why not just let AI write your paper and, and hand it in and get your A? And it's simple. It's really quite simple. It, I think it was Alfred North Whitehead who said this, a very, very wise thing. You think so that your thoughts can die instead of you. Okay, now this is biologically true. This is what makes human beings different from all other creatures, right? Maybe this is the spark of God in some sense tied to the biology. So the prefrontal cortex, which is the part of the brain that generates abstractions, grew out of the motor cortex, which is the part of the brain that enables you to voluntarily sequence your actions. So what thought is, thought is the space in which you create avatars of action, right? So what a thought we think because we're materialist atheists and we think we're scientists, we think that a thought is a description of the objective nature of the world. And that was, isn't what a thought is. A thought is a micro, it's a microcosmic avatar of you. That's what a thought is. And if it's a stupid thought, if then you could act it out. You could embody that avatar and then it would become you. But if it's, if it's a faulty avatar and you act it out, then you'll die or worse because there are worse things than dying. You'll end up in something like hell. And so why think so that you can generate virtual selves? Then why think critically so you can kill off the idiot virtual selves before you enact them? Why do that? So you don't die or end up in hell. That's why. So why should you think? So you don't die and end up at, or end up in hell. How do you learn to think? Well, not by having AI write your damn papers. The reason you're learning to write is because there's no difference between writing and thinking. And the reason you're learning to think is so that you don't, not only so that you don't fall into a pit, 
but so that you don't pull everyone you love kicking and screaming into the pit with you. And so you have cheat, cheat, go ahead, see what happens. So, so what you do with a liberal arts education, which you do very well here is you say, don't cheat because you'll put your immortal soul in danger. And people say, well, I don't believe in that. So that's like, go right ahead. T take your chances. You know, you make the presumption that you can manipulate the world by lying and cheating. Go out there and enact that and watch what happens. You know, we're having an argument about your culture, in our culture, about what's true. It's a deep argument. The scientists say, well, objective truth is true, but that's problematic because objective truth gives us no direction. And the postmodernists say, well, there's no overarching meta narrative and everything is relative, and they do that to justify their hedonism. And the truth of the matter is, we don't know how to define what's real. And most of us are materialists. The material world is what's real. Here's a different proposition what's real leads you away from hell. Now, that's actually a definition, right? It's a, it's a proposition that your life will be conducted most fully if you abide by the dictum that what's real is what leads you away from hell. And you might say, well, why would you assume that hell is real? And I would say, if you were there, you'd think it was real. Right. So, and I don't really know what to make of that metaphysically. I mean, I believe it's true and I've believed it for a very long time because I read a lot of literature about hell. And you think, well, hell isn't real. It's like, read about unit 731. That was a, that was a Japanese medical unit in China. You read about unit 731. And I would recommend, by the way, for those of you who are watching or listening, that you don't do this because you'll regret it if you do. You read about unit 731 and then come and tell me you don't believe hell is real. If you read enough about atrocity and totalitarian catastrophe, you will absolutely walk away from that thinking that hell is real. And then if you have any sense, you'll think, well, whatever I'm going to do in my life, I'm going to do whatever takes me as far away as from that as I can possibly get. You know, when, when this political scandal blew up around me in Canada, people come up to me and they say this, they say, you're so brave. And I think, you don't understand the difference between you and me is I know what to be properly afraid of, right? And I know that when the cat gets your tongue, you will end up in hell. You lose control of that logos, right? Because that's your capacity for voluntary speech, voluntary thought. You lose that link with the logos. You are headed for hell. And that is definitely worse than death. How many, could you estimate how many hours have you spent in private therapeutic counseling? I mean, doing counseling with doing people? Doing counseling with people. 15,000 hours. Yeah, see, that's seven. Might be more than that. Seven full working years. And uh, eight. But uh, here, here's why yeah, I that's asked. A, that's a conservative estimate. It, that's why I asked the question was, when you talk, like uh, academics who have a good education, which I fancy I do, are pretty good at understanding the implications of prop propositions. You know, like uh, if, if if you said that we're material beings, if we were purely material beings, of course, we couldn't know it. Dogs don't know that they're dogs. Uh, but so we we're good at things like that. Right. You're good at describing the consequences as they appear in individuals. Mm -hmm. And it's very dramatic. Mm -hmm. And well, is, this is one thing, you know, it's in, in many ways, it's terrifying to be a therapist and there's a variety of reasons for that. I mean, one of the things you learn if you're, if you're a therapist is that you really learn something about the intrinsic worth of people. Like some of the best people I met in my therapeutic practice, the best people morally were people who were the mo who were on the surface. They had nothing going for them. No, nothing worldly going for them. They weren't attractive. They weren't intelligent. They weren't accomplished. They weren't popular. In fact, they were often friendless. They often had devastated families. They had terrible developmental histories. They just had devastated lives. And yet there was still a core of ethical goodness to them that was stunning under the circumstances. Miraculous. And so you really, 
that really takes you back to see that that can happen, right? To see that sent that essential nobility of the human spirit, um, and so so that's a terrifying thing to see, and then and that that goodness can shine through in places that just look dark and and that no one is attending to. And the next thing you learn is don't impose your notions of someone's destiny on them. You do not know how that person's life should unfold. You're there to help them think that through. You are not there to give them advice. That's It's a theft. Giving someone advice, especially if you're a therapist, is theft. Because it's theft because if they succeed, well, then it's your success. And it's corrupt theft because if they fail, they bear the consequences and you don't. So, so that's terrifying. And then the other thing I learned that was terrifying was I never saw anyone in my therapeutic practice ever get away with anything even once. Like, the, you know, there's that old idea that God has a book and, and everything you do is written down. It's like, that's not just an idea. You get away with nothing. And of course it makes sense. It's like reality is real and you distort and bend it at your peril. And you may produce a rift temporarily, but that will snap closed on you. And you may not even notice the connection between your initial sin, failure to meet the target, to hit the target, and the consequences of that. But the consequences are inevitable. And it's even worse than that, because not only are they inevitable, they tend to multiply. And so all of that, to, to the degree that I've been capable, has scared me straight, let's say. It's like, no, nope, I'm not going down that path. And so, and you learn too, as a therapist, you learn the ancient truth that the truth is redemptive, right? And this is, this is another of the great accomplishments of Freud, because Freud shed new light on the logos in some ways, right? Because Freud understood that true speech heals, right? I mean, that's his, his entire therapeutic approach is bring people in and don't disturb them when they're trying to tell you something. Let them say anything. Absolutely. And that's what he told his clients too. It's like, say whatever comes to your mind, right? Let no matter how off color, off-putting, embarrassing, shameful, aggressive, sexual. Find out who you are. That's the first draft. Lay yourself out on the table. And while he had them lay themselves out on a couch, he hid from his clients so they couldn't. He was afraid that if they saw his face, they would censor themselves by watching his emotional reactions. So he sat off to the side of his clients so they could just say what they had to say with no interference. And you know this because you're an educator, but people cannot organize themselves and come to who they are without laying themselves out. And they can't lay themselves out without thinking or talking. Most people think by talking. In fact, you learn to think by talking. You can't talk if no one listens. Most people, most people have no one to listen to them. Yeah. If so, uh, you know, Education is a little bit different than therapy, but sometimes not. And one way it's different is now uh, education is a common project that people share. And each has to do his part or he won't get any benefit from it. But better together, as you say. And so around here, I, there's a, we have a lot of psychological counseling here when we need it. But also the kids counsel each other. And that's, and that's a different thing because they're in the same boat. They're trying to get the same thing done. They want to understand the most important things. And that's a form of therapy, actually, mm -hmm. when you think about it. Cause it's well, fun. actually, therapy is a form of that. Yeah. yeah right, yeah, right. Because, right. yeah, sure, sure. I mean, the therapeutic endeavor is dialogue, right? And it's, I guess, the advantage... If you have a good therapist, which is very rare and becoming more and more difficult as it becomes illegal to be a good therapist, which it already is, by the way, um, because it's now illegal to tell your clients what you think. And so that's the end of that enterprise because that's all there was to it. So, but therapy is, it's, it's dialogue in search of, it's dialogue 
look, it's a religious enterprise. It's motivated by love. What's our aim here? Therapeutic aim. To make things better. Why? Because we think it's worthy. It's a worthy enterprise to make things better. That's the proclamation of love, right? Love aims at making things better. Love aims at making the world more abundant. It aims at reducing unnecessary suffering, right? It's an ennobling enterprise, love. And so the therapeutic process aims at love and uses truth. And that's a religious enterprise. It's a logos enterprise. It's a dialogical enterprise. And it's a form of secularized religious practice. So I have one last question. Uh, I know you're doing things. You're, you go all over the world. You got friends and fans everywhere. You started in some kind of organization. Uh, my last question is, how are you going to save the world? One person at a time. Okay. Right? That's always how it's happened. You know, what's the leftist mantra? The long march through the institutions. Well, how do you combat that? With the longer march through the individuals. Mm. Right. There's, yeah. The rest of it's an illusion in, in a way. There, there are individuals. Right. That's where the rubber hits the road. Individuals suffer. Individuals bear responsibility. Right. One of the, one of the gifts, I suppose, that the biblical corpus gave to the UK the UK transformed into political wisdom and transmitted to the US was the proposition that the individual is the proper unit of analysis, the fundamental unit of analysis. And I believe that that's the case, which is why I'm a psychologist, as I said, and not a, not a sociologist or a, or a political operative. It's, it's the, the road, it's, it's always been the case that the route to heaven and away from hell is the root of the individual soul. It's, and I, I, I believe that that's it's theologically true. It's metaphysically true. It's philosophically true. I also believe that it's materially true, right? Insofar as that sort of truth can be instantiated materially. It's true at every level simultaneously. In agreeing with that, I will say all of the greatest philosophers, political philosophers, and all of the great, greatest statesmen thought precisely that. The purpose of the nation or the regime is the happiness of its people mm -hmm. and they come together to help make it but each has to make his own and that, that I, I think that's a very beautiful way that's how the founders of america organized the country and uh my own view is beautiful things cannot abidingly lose their luster and i will say that in our time which is a desperate time your success and influence is one of the key signs that I'm right about that. Thank you for being with me. Thank you, sir. It's always a pleasure to be at Hillsdale and to see you.